in the year of grace one thousand seven hundred and blank, for I do not remember the precise date. However, it was somewhere in the early part of the last century. There lived in the ancient city of the Manhattos a worthy burgher, Wolfert Webert by name. He was descended from old Cobus Weber of the Brill in Holland, one of the original settlers famous for introducing the cultivation of cabbages, and who came over to the province during the protectorship of Olofeif van Cortland, otherwise called the Dreamer. The field in which Cobus Weber first planted himself and his cabbages has remained ever since in the family, who continued in the same line of husbandry with that praiseworthy perseverance for which our Dutch burghers are noted. The whole family genius during several generations was devoted to the study and development of this one noble vegetable, and to this concentration of intellect may doubtless be ascribed the prodigious renown to which the Weber cabbages attained. The Weber dynasty continued in uninterrupted succession, and never did a line give more unquestionable proofs of legitimacy. The eldest son succeeded to the looks as well as the territory of his sire, and had the portraits of this line of tranquil potentates been taken, they would have presented a row of heads marvelously resembling in shape and magnitude the vegetables over which they reigned. The seat of government continued unchanged in the family mansion, a Dutch-built house with a front, or rather gable end, of yellow brick tapering to a point, with the customary iron weathercock at the top. Everything about the building bore the air of long-settled ease and security. Flights of martins peopled the little coops nailed against its walls, and swallows built their nests under the eaves, and everyone knows that these house-loving birds bring good luck to the dwelling where they take up their abode. In a bright summer morning in early summer, it was delectable to hear their cheerful notes as they sported about in the pure, sweet air, chirping forth, as it were, the greatness and prosperity of the Webbers. Thus, quietly and comfortably, did this excellent family vegetate under the shade of a mighty buttonwood tree, which by little and little grew so great as entirely to overshadow their palace. The city gradually spread its suburbs round their domain. Houses sprang up to interrupt their prospects. The rural lanes in the vicinity began to grow into the bustle and populousness of streets. In short, with all the habits of rustic life, they began to find themselves the inhabitants of a city. Still, however, they maintained their hereditary character and hereditary possessions, with all the tenacity of petty German princes in the midst of the empire. Wolfert was the last of the line, and succeeded to the patriarchal bench at the door, under the family tree, and swayed the scepter of his fathers, a kind of rural potentate in the midst of the metropolis. To share the cares and sweets of sovereignty, he had taken unto himself a helpmate, one of that excellent kind called Stirring Women. That is to say, she was one of those notable little housewives who are always busy where there is nothing to do. Her activity, however, took one particular direction. Her whole life seemed devoted to intense knitting. Whether at home or abroad, walking or sitting, her needles were continually in motion, and it is even affirmed that by her unwearied industry she very nearly supplied her household with stockings throughout the year. This worthy couple were blessed with one daughter, who was brought up with great tenderness and care. Uncommon pains had been taken with her education, so that she could stitch in every variety of way, make all kinds of pickles and preserves, and mark her own name on a sampler. The influence of her taste was also seen in the family garden, where the ornamental began to mingle with the useful. Whole rows of fiery marigolds and splendid hollyhocks bordered the cabbage beds, and gigantic sunflowers lolled their broad, jolly faces over the fences, seeming to ogle most affectionately the passers-by. Thus reigned and vegetated Wolfert Weber over his paternal acres, peacefully and contentedly. Not but that, like all other sovereigns, he had his occasional cares and vexations. The growth of his native city sometimes caused him annoyance. His little territory gradually became hemmed in by streets and houses, which intercepted air and sunshine. He was now and then subjected to the eruptions of the border population that infest the streets of a metropolis, who would make midnight forays into his dominions 
and carry off captive whole platoons of his noblest subjects. Vagrant swine would make a descent, too, now and then when the gate was left open, and lay all waste before them, and mischievous urchins would decapitate the illustrious sunflowers, the glory of the garden, as they lolled their heads so fondly over the walls. Still all these were petty grievances, which might now and then ruffle the surface of his mind as a summer breeze would ruffle the surface of a mill-pond, but they could not disturb the deep-seated quiet of his soul. He would but seize a trusty staff that stood behind the door, issue suddenly out, and anoint the back of the aggressor, whether pig or urchin, and then return within doors, marvelously refreshed and tranquilized. The chief cause of anxiety to honest Wolfert, however, was the growing prosperity of the city. The expenses of living doubled and trebled, but he could not double and treble the magnitude of his cabbages, and the number of competitors prevented the increase of price. Thus, therefore, while everyone around him grew richer, Wolfert grew poorer, and he could not, for the life of him, perceive how the evil was to be remedied. This growing care, which increased from day to day, had its gradual effect upon our worthy burgher, insomuch that it at length implanted two or three wrinkles in his brow, things unknown before in the family of the Webbers, and it seemed to pinch up the corners of his cocked hat into an expression of anxiety totally opposite to the tranquil, broad-brimmed, low-crowned beavers of his illustrious progenitors. Perhaps even this would not have materially disturbed the serenity of his mind had he only himself and his wife to care for, but there was his daughter gradually growing to maturity, and all the world knows that when daughters begin to ripen, no fruit or flower requires so much looking after. I have no talent at describing female charms, else fain I would depict the progress of this little Dutch beauty, how her blue eyes grew deeper and deeper, and her cherry lips redder and redder, how she ripened and ripened and rounded and rounded in the opening breath of sixteen summers until— in her seventeenth spring she seemed ready to burst out of her bodice like a half-blown rosebud. Ah, well a day, could I but show her as she was then, tricked out on a Sunday morning in the hereditary finery of the old Dutch clothes-press, of which her mother had confided to her the key, the wedding dress of her grandmother modernized for use, with sundry ornaments handed down as heirlooms in the family. Her pale brown hair smoothed with buttermilk in flat waving lines on each side of her fair forehead, the chain of yellow virgin gold that encircled her neck, the little cross that just rested at the entrance of a soft valley of happiness, as if it would sanctify the place. The— But, pooh, it is not for an old man like me to be prosing about female beauty. Suffice it to say, Amy had attained her seventeenth year, long since had her sampler exhibited hearts and couples desperately transfixed with arrows, and true lover's knots worked in deep blue silk, and it was evident she began to languish for some more interesting occupation than the rearing of sunflowers or pickling of cucumbers. At this critical period of female existence, when the heart within a damsel's bosom, like its emblem, the miniature which hangs without, is apt to be engrossed by a single image, a new visitor began to make his appearance under the roof of Wolford Weber. This was Dirk Waldron, the only son of a poor widow, but who could boast of more fathers than any lad in the province, for his mother had four husbands, and this only child, so that, though born in her last wedlock, he might fairly claim to be the tardy fruit of a long course of cultivation. This son of four fathers united the merits and vigor of all his sires. If he had not a great family before him, he seemed likely to have a great one after him, for you had only to look at the fresh, buxom youth to see that he was formed to be the founder of a mighty race. This youngster gradually became an intimate visitor of the family. He talked little, but he sat long. He filled the father's pipe when it was empty, gathered up the mother's knitting needle or ball of worsted when it fell to the ground, stroked the sleek coat of the tortoise-shell cat, and replenished the teapot for the daughter from the bright copper kettle that sang before the fire. All these quiet little offices might seem of trifling import, but when true love is translated into low Dutch, it is in this way that it eloquently expresses itself. They were not lost upon the Weber family, 
the winning youngster found marvelous favor in the eyes of the mother. The tortoiseshell cat, albeit the most staid and demure of her kind, gave indubitable signs of approbation of his visits. The tea kettle seemed to sing out a cheering note of welcome at his approach. And if the sly glances of the daughter might be rightly read, as she sat bridling and dimpling and sewing by her mother's side, she was not a whit behind Dame Weber or Grammelkin or the tea kettle in good will. Wolfert alone saw nothing of what was going on. Profoundly wrapped up in meditation on the growth of the city and his cabbages, he sat looking in the fire and puffing his pipe in silence. One night, however, as the gentle Amy, according to custom, lighted her lover to the outer door, and he, according to custom, took his parting salute, the smack resounded so vigorously through the long, silent entry as to startle even the dull ear of Wolfert. He was slowly roused to a new source of anxiety. It had never entered into his head that this mere child, who, as it seemed, but the other day had been climbing about his knees and playing with dolls and baby houses, could all at once be thinking of lovers and matrimony. He rubbed his eyes, examined into the fact, and really found that while he'd been dreaming of other matters, she had actually grown to be a woman, and what was worse, had fallen in love. Here arose new cares for Wolfert. He was a kind father, but he was a prudent man. The young man was a lively, stirring lad. But then he had neither money nor land. Wolfert's ideas all ran in one channel, and he saw no alternative in case of a marriage but to portion off the young couple with a corner of his cabbage garden, the whole of which was barely sufficient for the support of his family. Like a prudent father, therefore, he determined to nip this passion in the bud, and forbade the youngster the house, though sorely it did go against his fatherly heart, and many a silent tear did it cause in the bright eye of his daughter. She showed herself, however, a pattern of filial piety and obedience. She never pouted and sulked. She never flew in the face of parental authority. She never flew into a passion, nor fell into hysterics, as many romantic, novel-read young ladies would do. Not she, indeed. She was none such heroical, rebellious trumpery, I'll warrant you. On the contrary, she acquiesced like an obedient daughter, shut the street door in her lover's face, and if ever she did grant him an interview, it was either out of the kitchen window or over the garden fence. Wolfert was deeply cogitating these matters in his mind, and his brow wrinkled with unusual care as he wended his way one Saturday afternoon to a rural inn about two miles from the city. It was a favorite resort of the Dutch part of the community, from being always held by a Dutch line of landlords, and retaining an air and relish of the good old times. It was a Dutch-built house that had probably been a country seat of some opulent burgher in the early time of the settlement. It stood near a point of land called Corlier's Hook, which stretches out into the sound, and against which the tide, at its flux and reflux, sets with extraordinary rapidity. The venerable and somewhat crazy mansion was distinguished from afar by a grove of elms and sycamores that seemed to wave a hospitable invitation while a few weeping willows, with their dank, drooping foliage resembling falling waters, gave an idea of coolness that rendered it an attractive spot during the heats of summer. Here, therefore, as I said, resorted many of the old inhabitants of the Manhattos, where, while some played at shuffleboard and quoits and ninepins, others smoked a deliberate pipe and talked over public affairs. It was on a blustering autumnal afternoon that Wolfert made his visit to the inn, the grove of elms and willows was stripped of its leaves, which whirled in rustling eddies about the fields. The nine-pin alley was deserted, for the premature chilliness of the day had driven the company within doors. As it was Saturday afternoon, the habitual club was in session, composed principally of regular Dutch burghers, though mingled occasionally with persons of various character and country, as is natural in a place of such motley population. Beside the fireplace, in a huge leather-bottomed armchair, sat the dictator of this little world, the venerable Rem, or, as it was pronounced, Ranim Rapalai. He was a man of Walloon race, and illustrious for the antiquity of his line, his great-grandmother having been the first white child born in the province. But he was still more illustrious for his wealth and dignity, 
He had long filled the noble office of alderman, and was a man to whom the governor himself took off his hat. He had maintained possession of the leather-bottomed chair from time immemorial, and had gradually waxed in bulk as he sat in his seat of government, until in the course of years he filled its whole magnitude. His word was decisive with his subjects, for he was so rich a man he was never expected to support any opinion by argument. The landlord waited on him with peculiar officiousness, not that he paid better than his neighbors, but then the coin of a rich man always seems to be so much more acceptable. The landlord had ever a pleasant word and a joke to insinuate in the ear of the august rum. It was true rum never laughed, and indeed ever maintained a mastiff-like gravity and even surliness of aspect. Yet he now and then rewarded mine host with a token of approbation, which, though nothing more nor less than a kind of grunt, still delighted the landlord more than a broad laugh from a poorer man. "'This will be a rough night for the money-diggers,' said mine host, as a gust of wind howled round the house and rattled at the windows. "'What, are they at their works again?' said an English half-pay captain with one eye, who was a very frequent attendant at the inn. "'Aye, they are,' said the landlord. "'And well may they be. They've had luck of late. They say a great pot of money has been dug up in the fields just behind Stuyvesant's orchard.' "'Fudge!' said the one-eyed man of war, as he added a small portion of water to a bottom of brandy. "'Well, believe it or not, as you please,' said mine host, somewhat netted. "'But everybody knows that the old governor buried a great deal of his money at the time of the Dutch troubles, when the English redcoats seized on the province. They say, too, the old gentleman walks, aye, and in the very same dress that he wears in the picture that hangs up in the family house.' "'Fudge!' said the half-pay officer. Fudge, if you please. But didn't Corny van Zant see him at midnight stalking about in the meadow with his wooden leg and a drawn sword in his hand that flashed like fire? And what can he be walking for but because people have been troubling the place where he buried his money in old times? Here the landlord was interrupted by several guttural sounds from Ram Ramply, betokening that he was laboring with the unusual production of an idea. As he was too great a man to be slighted by a prudent publican, mine host respectfully paused until he should deliver himself. The corpulent frame of this mighty burgher now gave all the symptoms of a volcanic mountain on the point of an eruption. First there was a certain heaving of the abdomen, not unlike an earthquake. Then was emitted a cloud of tobacco smoke from that crater, his mouth. Then there was a kind of rattle in the throat, as if the idea were working its way up through a region of phlegm. Then there were several disjointed members of a sentence thrown out, ending in a cough. At length his voice forced its way into a slow but absolute tone of a man who feels the weight of his purse, if not of his ideas, every portion of his speech being marked by a testy puff of tobacco smoke. "'Who talks of old Peter Stuyvesant's walking?' puff. Have people no respect for persons? Puff, puff. Peter Stuyvesant knew better what to do with his money than to bury it. Puff. I know the Stuyvesant family. Puff. Every one of them. Puff. Not a more respectable family in the province. Puff. Old standards. Puff. Warm householders. Puff. None of your upstarts. Puff. 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 Don't talk to me of Peter Stuyvesant's walking. Puff. 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 Here the redoubtable ram contracted his brow, clasped up his mouth till it wrinkled at each corner, and redoubled his smoking with such vehemence that the cloudy volume soon wreathed round his head as the smoke envelops the awful summit of Mount Etna. A general silence followed the sudden rebuke of this very rich man. The subject, however, was too interesting to be readily abandoned. The conversation soon broke forth again from the lips of Peachy Prow Van Hook, the chronicler of the club, one of those prosing, narrative old men who seem to be troubled with an incontinence of words as they grow old. Peachy could at any time tell as many stories in an evening as his hearers could digest in a month, 
He now resumed the conversation by affirming that, to his knowledge, money had at different times been digged up in various parts of the island. The lucky persons who had discovered them had always dreamed of them three times beforehand, and, what was worthy of remark, those treasures had never been found but by some descendant of the good old Dutch families, which clearly proved that they'd been buried by Dutchmen in the olden time. "'Fiddlesticks with your Dutchmen!' cried the half-pay officer. "'The Dutch had nothing to do with them. They were all buried by Kidd, the pirate, and his crew.' Here a keynote was touched that roused the whole company. The name of Captain Kidd was like a talisman in those times, and was associated with a thousand marvelous stories. The half-pay officer took the lead, and in his narrations fathered upon Kidd all the plunderings and exploits of Morgan, Blackbeard, and the whole list of bloody buccaneers. The officer was a man of great weight among the peaceable members of the club, by reason of his warlike character and gunpowder tales. All his golden stories of Kidd, however, and the booty he had buried, were obstinately rivaled by the tales of Peachy Prow, who, rather than suffer his Dutch progenitors to be eclipsed by a foreign freebooter, enriched every field and shore in the neighborhood with the hidden wealth of Peter Stuyvesant and his contemporaries. Not a word of this conversation was lost upon Wolfert Weber, he returned pensively home, full of magnificent ideas. The soil of his native island seemed to be turned into gold dust, and every field to teem with treasure. His head almost reeled at the thought of how often he must have heedlessly rambled over places where countless sums lay, scarcely covered by the turf beneath his feet. His mind was in an uproar with this whirl of new ideas. As he came in sight of the venerable mansion of his forefathers, and the little realm where the Webbers had so long and so contentedly flourished, his gorge rose at the narrowness of his destiny. "'Unlucky Wolfert!' exclaimed he. "'Others can go to bed and dream themselves into whole mines of wealth. They have but to seize a spade in the morning and turn up doubloons like potatoes. But thou must dream of hardships and rise to poverty, must dig thy field from year's end to year's end, and yet raise nothing but cabbages. Wolfert Weber went to bed with a heavy heart, and it was long before the golden visions that disturbed his brain permitted him to sink into repose. The same visions, however, extended into his sleeping thoughts, and assumed a more definite form. He dreamed that he had discovered an immense treasure in the center of his garden, at every stroke of the spade he laid bare a golden ingot. Diamond crosses sparkled out of the dust. Bags of money turned up their bellies, corpulent with pieces of eight, or venerable doubloons, and chests wedged close with moiders, ducats, and pistarines yawned before his ravished eyes and vomited forth their glittering contents. Wolfert awoke a poorer man than ever. He had no heart to go about his daily concerns, which appeared so paltry and profitless, but sat all day long in the chimney corner, picturing to himself ingots and heaps of gold in the fire. The next night his dream was repeated. He was again in his garden digging, and lay open stores of hidden wealth. There was something very singular in this repetition. He passed another day of reverie, and though it was cleaning day and the house, as usual in Dutch households, completely topsy-turvy, yet he sat unmoved amidst the general uproar. The third night he went to bed with a palpitating heart. He put on his red nightcap wrong side outward for good luck. It was deep midnight before his anxious mind could settle itself into sleep. Again the golden dream was repeated, and again he saw his garden teeming with ingots and money bags. Wolfert rose the next morning in complete bewilderment. A dream three times repeated was never known to lie, and if so, his fortune was made. In his agitation, he put on his waistcoat with the hind part before, and this was a corroboration of good luck. He no longer doubted that a huge store of money lay buried somewhere in his cabbage field, coyly waiting to be sought for, and he repined at having so long been scratching about the surface of the soil instead of digging to the center.
He took his seat at the breakfast table, full of these speculations, asked his daughter to put a lump of gold into his tea, and on handing his wife a plate of slapjacks, begged her to help herself to a doubloon. His grand care now was how to secure this immense treasure without its being known. Instead of his working regularly in his grounds in the daytime, he now stole from his bed at night, and with spade and pickaxe went to work to rip up and dig about his paternal acres, from one end to the other. In a little time the whole garden, which had presented such a goodly and regular appearance, with its phalanx of cabbages, like a vegetable army in battle array, was reduced to a scene of devastation while the relentless Wolfert, with nightcap on head and lantern and spade in hand, stalked through the slaughtered ranks the destroying angel of his own vegetable world. Every morning bore testimony to the ravages of the preceding night in cabbages of all ages and conditions, from the tender sprout to the full-grown head, piteously rooted from their quiet beds like worthless weeds and left to wither in the sunshine. In vain Wolfert's wife remonstrated. In vain his darling daughter wept over the destruction of some favorite marigold. Thou shalt have gold of another guest sort, he would cry, chucking her under the chin. Thou shalt have a string of crooked ducats for thy wedding necklace, my child. His family began really to fear that the poor man's wits were diseased. He muttered in his sleep at night about mines of wealth, about pearls and diamonds and bars of gold. In the daytime he was moody and abstracted, and walked about as if in a trance. Dame Weber held frequent councils with all the old women of the neighborhood. Scarce an hour in the day, but a knot of them might be seen wagging their white caps together round her door, while the poor woman made some piteous recital. The daughter, too, was fain to seek for more frequent consolation from the stolen interviews of her favored swain, Dirk Waldron. The delectable little Dutch songs with which she used to dulcify the house grew less and less frequent, and she would forget her sewing and look wistfully in her father's face as he sat pondering by the fireside. Wolfert caught her eye one day fixed on him thus anxiously, and for a moment was roused from his golden reveries. "'Cheer up, my girl,' said he exultingly. "'Why dost thou droop? "'Thou shalt hold up thy head one day "'with the Brinkerhoffs and the Shermerhorns, "'the Van Horns and the Van Dams. "'By St. Nicholas, but the patroon himself "'shall be glad to get thee for his son.' "'Amy shook her head at his vainglorious boast "'and was more than ever in doubt "'of the soundness of the good man's intellect.' In the meantime, Wolfert went on digging and digging, but the field was extensive, and as his dream had indicated no precise spot, he had to dig at random. The winter set in before one-tenth of the scene of promise had been explored. The ground became frozen hard, and the night too cold for the labors of the spade. No sooner, however, did the returning warmth of spring loosen the soil, and the small frogs began to pipe in the meadows, but Wolfert resumed his labors with renovated zeal. Still, however, the hours of industry were reversed. Instead of working cheerily all day planting and setting out his vegetables, he remained thoughtfully idle until the shades of night summoned him to his secret labors. In this way he continued to dig from night to night and week to week and month to month, but not a stiver did he find. On the contrary, the more he digged, the poorer he grew. The rich soil of his garden was digged away, and the sand and gravel from beneath was thrown to the surface, until the whole field presented an aspect of sandy barrenness. In the meantime, the seasons gradually rolled on. The little frogs which had piped in the meadows in early spring croaked as bullfrogs during the summer heats and then sank into silence. The peach tree budded, blossomed, and bore its fruit. The swallows and martins came, twittered about the roof, built their nests, reared their young, held their congress among the eaves, 
and then winged their flight in search of another spring. The caterpillar spun its winding sheet, dangled it from the great buttonwood tree before the house, turned into a moth, fluttered with the last sunshine of summer, and disappeared. And finally the leaves of the buttonwood tree turned yellow, then brown, then rustled one by one to the ground, and whirling about in little eddies of wind and dust, whispered that winter was at hand. Wolfert gradually woke from his dream of wealth as the year declined. He had reared no crop for the supply of his household during the sterility of winter. The season was long and severe, and for the first time the family was really straitened in its comforts. By degrees a revulsion of thought took place in Wolfert's mind, common to those whose golden dreams have been disturbed by pinching realities. The idea gradually stole upon him that he should come to want. He already considered himself one of the most unfortunate men in the province, having lost such an incalculable amount of undiscovered treasure, and now, when thousands of pounds had eluded his search, to be perplexed for shillings and pence was cruel in the extreme. Haggard care gathered about his brow. He went about with a money-seeking air, his eyes bent downward into the dust, and carrying his hands in his pockets, as men are apt to do when they have nothing else to put in them. He could not even pass the city almshouse without giving it a rueful glance as if destined to be his future abode. The strangeness of his conduct and of his looks occasioned much speculation and remark. For a long time he was suspected of being crazy, and then everybody pitied him. And at length it began to be suspected that he was poor, and then everybody avoided him. The rich old burghers of his acquaintance met him outside of the door when he called, entertained him hospitably on the threshold, pressed him warmly by the hand at parting, shook their heads as he walked away, with the kind-hearted expression of, Poor Wolfert, and turned a corner nimbly if by chance they saw him approaching as they walked the streets. Even the barber and the cobbler of the neighborhood, and a tattered tailor in an alley hard by, three of the poorest and merriest rogues in the world, eyed him with that abundant sympathy which usually attends a lack of means, and there is not a doubt but their pockets would have been at his command, only that they happened to be empty. Thus everybody deserted the Weber mansion, as if poverty were contagious like the plague. Everybody but honest Dirk Waldron, who still kept up his stolen visits to the daughter, and indeed seemed to wax more affectionate as the fortunes of his mistress were on the wane. Many months had elapsed since Wolfert had frequented his old resort, the Rural Inn. He was taking a long, lonely walk one Saturday afternoon, musing over his wants and disappointments, when his feet took instinctively their wonted direction, and on awaking out of a reverie, he found himself before the door of the inn. For some moments he hesitated whether to enter, but his heart yearned for companionship, and where can a ruined man find better companionship than at a tavern, where there is neither sober example nor sober advice to put him out of countenance? Wolfert found several of the old frequenters of the inn at their usual posts, and seated in their usual places. But one was missing, the great Ram Repelli, who for many years had filled the leather-bottomed chair of state. His place was supplied by a stranger, who seemed, however, completely at home in the chair and the tavern. He was rather undersized, but deep-chested, square, and muscular. His broad shoulders, double joints, and bow knees gave tokens of prodigious strength. His face was dark and weather-beaten. A deep scar, as if from the slash of a cutlass, had almost divided his nose, and made a gash in his upper lip through which his teeth shone like a bulldog's. A mop of iron-gray hair gave a grisly finish to this hard-favored visage, 
His dress was of an amphibious character. He wore an old hat edged with tarnished lace and cocked in martial style on one side of his head, a rusty blue military coat with brass buttons, and a wide pair of short petticoat trousers, or rather breeches, for they were gathered up at the knees. He ordered everybody about him with an authoritative air, talking in a brattling voice that sounded like the crackling of thorns under a pot, deed the landlord and servants with perfect impunity, and was waited upon with greater obsequiousness than had ever been shown to the mighty Ram himself. Wolfert's curiosity was awakened to know who and what was this stranger, who had thus usurped absolute sway in this ancient domain. Peachy Prow took him aside into a remote corner of the hall, and there, in an undervoice and with great caution, imparted to him all that he knew on the subject. The inn had been aroused several months before on a dark, stormy night by repeated long shouts that seemed like the howlings of a wolf. They came from the water side, and at length were distinguished to be hailing the house in a seafaring manner. House ahoy! The landlord turned out with his head waiter, tapster, hostler, and errand boy, that is to say, with his old negro cuff. On approaching the place whence the voice proceeded, they found this amphibious-looking personage at the water's edge, quite alone and seated on a great oaken sea-chest. How he came there, whether he had been set on shore from some boat, or had floated to land on his chest, nobody could tell, for he did not seem disposed to answer questions, and there was something in his looks and manners that put a stop to all questioning. Suffice it to say, he took possession of a corner room of the inn to which his chest was removed with great difficulty. Here he had remained ever since, keeping about the inn and its vicinity. Sometimes, it is true, he disappeared for one, two, or three days at a time, going and returning without giving any notice or account of his movements. He always appeared to have plenty of money, though often of very strange outlandish coinage, and he regularly paid his bill every evening before turning in. He had fitted up his room to his own fancy, having slung a hammock from the ceiling instead of a bed, and decorated the walls with rusty pistols and cutlasses of foreign workmanship. A greater part of his time was passed in this room, seated by the window, which commanded a wide view of the sound, a short, old-fashioned pipe in his mouth, a glass of rum toddy at his elbow, and a pocket telescope in his hand, with which he reconnoitred every boat that moved upon the water. Large, square-rigged vessels seemed to excite but little attention, but the moment he descried anything with a shoulder of mutton sail, or that of a barge or yawl or jolly boat hove in sight, up went the telescope, and he examined it with the most scrupulous attention. All this might have passed without much notice, for in those times the province was so much the resort of adventurers of all characters and climes that any oddity in dress or behavior attracted but small attention. In a little while, however, this strange sea monster, thus strangely cast upon dry land, began to encroach upon the long-established customs and customers of the place, and to interfere in a dictatorial manner in the affairs of the Ninepin Alley and the Bar Room, until in the end he usurped an absolute command over the whole inn. It was all in vain to attempt to withstand his authority. He was not exactly quarrelsome, but boisterous and peremptory, like one accustomed to tyrannize on a quarter-deck, and there was a daredevil air about everything he said and did that inspired wariness in all bystanders. Even the half-pay officer, so long the hero of the club, was soon silenced by him, and the quiet burghers stared with wonder at seeing their inflammable man-of-war so readily and quietly extinguished. And then the tales that he would tell were enough to make a peaceable man's hair stand on end. There was not a sea fight, nor marauding, nor freebooting adventure, 
that had happened within the last twenty years, but he seemed perfectly versed in it. He delighted to talk of the exploits of the buccaneers in the West Indies and on the Spanish Main. How his eyes would glisten as he described the waylaying of treasure ships, the desperate fights yardarm and yardarm, broadside and broadside, the boarding and capturing of huge Spanish galleons. With what chuckling relish would he describe the descent upon some rich Spanish colony, the rifling of a church, the sacking of a convent? You would have thought you heard some gormandizer dilating upon the roasting of a savory goose at Michaelmas, as he described the roasting of some Spanish don to make him discover his treasure, a detail given with a minuteness that made every rich old burgher present turn uncomfortably in his chair. All this would be told with infinite glee, as if he considered it an excellent joke, and then he would give such a tyrannical leer in the face of his next neighbor that the poor man would be fain to laugh out of sheer faint-heartedness. If anyone, however, pretended to contradict him in any of his stories, he was on fire in an instant. His very cocked hat assumed a momentary fierceness and seemed to resent the contradiction. How the devil should you know as well as I, I tell you, it was as I say. And he would, at the same time, let slip a broadside of thundering oaths and tremendous sea phrases, such as had never been heard before within these peaceful walls. Indeed, the worthy burghers began to surmise that he knew more of these stories than mere hearsay. Day after day their conjectures concerning him grew more and more wild and fearful. The strangeness of his arrival, the strangeness of his manners, the mystery that surrounded him, all made him something incomprehensible in their eyes. He was a kind of monster of the deep to them. He was a merman, he was a behemoth, he was a leviathan. In short, they knew not what he was. The domineering spirit of this boisterous sea urchin at length grew quite intolerable. He was no respecter of persons. He contradicted the richest burghers without hesitation. He took possession of the sacred elbow chair, which time out of mind had been the seat of sovereignty of the illustrious Ram Repelgi. Nay, he even went so far in one of his rough jocular moods as to slap that mighty burger on the back, drink his toddy, and wink in his face, a thing scarcely to be believed. From this time, Ram Repelgi appeared no more at the inn. His example was followed by several of the most eminent customers, who were too rich to tolerate being bullied out of their opinions, or being obliged to laugh at another man's jokes. The landlord was almost in despair, but he knew not how to get rid of this sea monster and his sea chest, who seemed both to have grown like fixtures or excrescences, on his establishment. Such was the account whispered cautiously in Wolfert's ear by the narrator Peachy Prowl, as he held him by the button in a corner of the hall, casting a wary glance now and then toward the door of the bar-room, lest he should be overheard by the terrible hero of his tale. Wolfert took his seat in a remote part of the room in silence, impressed with profound awe of this unknown so versed in freebooting history. It was to him a wonderful instance of the revolutions of mighty empires to find the venerable Ram Repelli thus ousted from the throne, and a rugged tarpaulin dictating from his elbow chair, hectoring the patriarchs and filling this tranquil little realm with brawl and bravado. The stranger was on this evening in a more than usually communicative mood, and was narrating a number of astounding stories of plunderings and burnings on the high seas. He dwelt upon them with peculiar relish, heightening the frightful particulars in proportion to their effect on his peaceful auditors. He gave a swaggering detail of the capture of a Spanish merchantman. She was lying becalmed during a long summer's day, just off from the island which was one of the lurking places of the pirates. They had reconnoitred her with their spyglasses from the shore, and ascertained her character and force. 
at night a picked crew of daring fellows set off for her in a whale-boat they approached with muffled oars as she lay rocking idly with the undulations of the sea and her sails flapping against the masts they were close under the stern before the guard on deck was aware of their approach the alarm was given the pirates threw hand grenades on deck and sprang up the main chains sword in hand the crew flew to arms but in great confusion some were shot down others took refuge in the tops others were driven overboard and drowned while others fought hand to hand from the main deck to the quarter deck disputing gallantly every inch of ground there were three spanish gentlemen on board with their ladies who made the most desperate resistance they defended the companionway cut down several of their assailants and fought like very devils for they were maddened by the shrieks of the ladies from the cabin one of the dons was old and soon dispatched the other two kept their ground vigorously even though the captain of the pirates was among their assailants just then there was a shout of victory from the main deck the ship is ours cried the pirates one of the dons immediately dropped his sword and surrendered the other who was a hot-headed youngster and just married gave the captain a slash in the face that laid all open the captain just made out to articulate the words no quarter and what did they do with their prisoners said peachy praw eagerly threw them all overboard was the answer a dead pause followed the reply peachy praw sank quietly back like a man who had unwarily stolen upon the lair of a sleeping lion the honest burghers cast fearful glances at the deep scar slashed across the visage of the stranger and moved their chairs a little farther off the seaman however smoked on without moving a muscle as though he either did not perceive or did not regard the unfavorable effect he had produced upon his hearers the half-pay officer was the first to break the silence for he was continually tempted to make ineffectual head against this tyrant of the seas and to regain his lost consequence in the eyes of his ancient companions he now tried to match the gunpowder tales of the stranger by others equally tremendous kidd as usual was his hero concerning whom he seemed to have picked up many of the floating traditions of the province the seaman had always evinced a settled pique against the one-eyed warrior on this occasion he listened with peculiar impatience he sat with one arm akimbo, the other elbow on the table, the hand holding on to the small pipe he was pettishly puffing, his legs crossed, drumming with one foot on the ground, and casting every now and then the side glance of a basilisk at the prosing captain. At length the latter spoke of Kidd's having ascended the Hudson with some of his crew to land his plunder in secrecy. Kidd up the Hudson! burst forth the seaman with a tremendous oath kidd was never up the hudson i tell you he was said the other ay and they say he buried a quantity of treasure on the little flat that runs out into the river called the devil's dan kammer the devil's dan's kammer in your teeth cried the seaman i tell you kidd was never up the hudson what a plague do you know of kidd and his haunts what do i know echoed the half-pay officer why i was in london at the time of his trial i and i had the pleasure of seeing him hanged at execution dock then sir let me tell you that you saw as pretty a fellow hanged as ever trod shoe leather ay putting his face nearer to that of the officer and there was many a landlubber looked on that might much better have swung in his stead the half-pay officer was silenced but the indignation thus pent up in his bosom glowed with intense vehemence in his single eye which kindled like a coal peachy pra who could never remain silent observed that the gentleman certainly was in the right kidd never did bury money up the hudson nor indeed in any of those parts though many affirmed such to be a fact 
It was Bradish and others of the buccaneers who had buried money, some said in Turtle Bay, others on Long Island, others in the neighborhood of Hellgate. Indeed, added he, I recollect an adventure of Sam, the Negro fisherman, many years ago, which some think had something to do with the buccaneers. As we are all friends here, and as it will go no further, I'll tell it to you. Upon a dark night many years ago, as Black Sam was returning from fishing in Hellgate, here the story was nipped in the bud by a sudden movement from the unknown, who, laying his iron fist on the table, knuckles downward, with a quiet force that indented the very boards, and looking grimly over his shoulder with the grin of an angry bear, Hark ye, neighbor, said he, with significant nodding of the head, you'd better let the buccaneers and their money alone. They're not for old men and old women to meddle with. They fought hard for their money. They gave body and soul for it, and wherever it lies buried, depend upon it, he must have a tug with the devil who gets it. This sudden explosion was succeeded by a blank silence throughout the room. Peachy Praw shrunk within himself, and even the one-eyed officer turned pale. Wolfert, who from a dark corner of the room had listened with intense eagerness to all this talk about buried treasure, looked with mingled awe and reverence at this bold buccaneer for such he really suspected him to be. There was a chinking of gold and a sparkling of jewels in all his stories about the Spanish main that gave a value to every period, and Wolfert would have given anything for the rummaging of the ponderous sea chest, which his imagination crammed full of golden chalices, crucifixes, and jolly round bags of doubloons. The dead stillness that had fallen upon the company was at length interrupted by the stranger, who pulled out a prodigious watch of curious and ancient workmanship, and which in Wolfert's eyes had a decidedly Spanish look. On touching a spring it struck ten o'clock, upon which the sailor called for his reckoning, and having paid it out of a handful of outlandish coin, he drank off the remainder of his beverage, and without taking leave of any one, rolled out of the room muttering to himself as he stamped upstairs to his chamber. It was some time before the company could recover from the silence into which they had been thrown. The very footsteps of the stranger, which were heard now and then as he traversed his chamber, inspired awe. Still, the conversation in which they had been engaged was too interesting not to be resumed. A heavy thunder gust had gathered up unnoticed while they were lost in talk, and the torrents of rain that fell forbade all thoughts of setting off for home until the storm should subside. They drew nearer together, therefore, and entreated the worthy Peachy Praw to continue the tale which had been so discourteously interrupted. He readily complied, whispering, however, in a tone scarcely above his breath, and drowned occasionally by the rolling of the thunder, and he would pause every now and then and listen with evident awe, as he heard the heavy footsteps of the stranger pacing overhead. The following is the purport of his story. 